As I was preparing for this morning, I think the most unique thing, the, the cool thing, is that I was in Israel. I was where Jesus walked. I got to see the foundation stones of the Western Wall where the temple was. And I was more excited this morning for church than I was that whole trip. I'm very glad to be back because I love our church. I love being a part of this group. And today, timely, we're in Revelation 3, starting in verse 7, the Church of Philadelphia, and it's the Church of Brotherly Love. And so that was a big takeaway for me, is that no matter how much I was enjoying the trip, my heart was always back home, because I know I'm where God wants me to be. And that's a great feeling, to know you are in God's will, to know you're doing what God has called you in your life to do. and. This church of brotherly love, I'm actually to open with a, a side scripture, Psalm 133. It's only three verses long, but we're just covering the first two. We're going to chop it small. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head, running down the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down the edge of his garments. Behold how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. There's something about brotherly love, to have a place where you come together and you love one another. And we've had enough messages on love. I could spend a lot of time today. There's so much more about this Philadelphia church than the love factor, that they had a brotherly love for one another. And that was a big part. But, you know, you can choose your friends, but you can't choose your family, right? And that's true about the church, isn't it? I didn't get to pick you guys, <laughs> right? You didn't get to pick me. It's just, this is family. You get together with people, and because it's love, we have to choose to love each other from time to time. Because, again, your friends, you can just cut off, but your family, you're stuck with. And truthfully, that's where love comes in. It's a choice. It's a choice we make to love one another and to dwell in this brotherly love. And here's the cool thing. I learned at last year's men's conference in Seattle um, David Guzik was there, and he will be at that upcoming men's conference we're going to in, uh, in Longview. And if you haven't put the two and two together, so Pastor Al, that Pat mentioned he had the red baseball cap on the video, he is the pastor of Longview. So if by chance that's the retreat, the men's conference, one day thing we're trying to go over, backing up. David Guzik, last time, what I learned from him, he pointed out that I've always known 133 verse 1, how pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together in unity. But then it compares it to the oil running down the beard of Aaron. Now this is like the priestly oil used at the tabernacle in Aaron's time and later in the temple. And if we read the Bible and went back and read the instruction on how to make it, it's a very simple oil to make. But it's strictly forbidden in the Bible to try and replicate it. No one was allowed to make an oil like that oil. And the key here is this brotherly love, it's not supposed to be faked. It's not supposed to be copied. It's supposed to be authentic and real. And that's, I think, the simile I never picked up before. It's like, it's like this oil running down. What's well, the beard of Aaron? What's well, the priestly oil? You can't fake this. You've got to have it for real. And so we're learning about this city of Philadelphia, and it is literally a city of brotherly love because it was founded in 189 B.C., by King Eumenes, and it was kind of dedicated to his brother, uh, Attilus. And what's interesting is he, the first king died, and then the second brother came over, but while the first king was reigning, he like named a bunch of streets after his brother. He erected pillars in honor of his brother, did all, and then when he passed away, the second brother takes over the city, and he actually then starts naming streets after his other brother, building buildings and, and pillars, monumental pi uh, pillars, that were in honor of his brother. So it's like a very brotherly love thing is more than one might expect. So they have these two guys and they have this city. Some interesting facts about the city before we dive in to the text. Uh, it was, I mean, there's the normal stuff. It was a Roman city, right? They had uh, grapes being their primary uh, agriculture, very much like the valley. 
Uh, the production of wine was their big thing, and so uh, Dionysus was the god that they worshipped, because she was for about uh, the, the vineyards and the fields, so they have their goddess that they worshipped. Uh, but one big thing was both them and Sardis, whom we previously talked about, they were hit with some pretty rocking earthquakes, and the whole city had been destroyed multiple times due to earthquakes, rebuilt. In 1780, Caesar Tiberius funded the rebuild of the city, and because of this, they renamed the city from Philadelphia uh, to Neo Caesarea. It's like Caesarea, just like there's a Caesarea Philippi and Caesarea by the sea in Jerusalem or in Israel. You have to go to both on our trip. This is another Caesarea. But they call it Neo, New Caesarea. And it's after the Caesar. You're naming it on the king. Later, then, they got help from. Uh, another Caesar. They got help from Vespasian. They named, renamed the city again, Flavia, after Flavius, uh, Vespasian. And they have all these renames. Eventually, by the time this was written, it goes back to Philadelphia. And these are just fun facts. As we get into our text, these, this historical background actually is going to play a role in what he's writing to them. When you understand what their background is, remember this is being written to real people in a real church in 95 AD. So these little background stories they're going to tie in a lot to what Jesus is writing to his church. So let us now read our text, and we'll go back and take it from the top to the bottom. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan, who say they are Jews and are not, but why? Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet, and to know that I have loved you. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world, to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let's pray one more time. Father God, we pray that you do give us ears to hear what you are saying to your church, what your Holy Spirit would speak to our hearts, that your word is alive and that it is always touching us when we are seeking its touch and that it'll always guide us and direct us when we need to hear from it. So I pray God today that you would open our ears, soften our hearts, from myself to every single person in this room, that we would be ready and willing to hear what you, Jesus, are writing to us. Praise in Jesus' name. Amen. So, we talked about the periods of time as well that these churches represent. And it's, it's kind of just like a bonus nugget. You know, the intent wasn't that these letters were written so that they'd be symbolic of church history and the different periods of the time, but they are. It's one of those things, hey, it's just so amazing to see how God works, how he writes these prophecies that have <coughs> short and long-term fulfillment. The youth on Thursdays, we just started going through Isaiah, and we're looking at you know, some of these things where there's a, there's a fulfillment here, and there's going to be another fulfillment there. And it's just, it's mind-blowing how it works, how God makes all this stuff come together. And that's, I think, one of the testimonies of the Bible, that it is the Word of God, is that... <laughs> He blows our mind with the way that he makes things work in eight different ways, and they all work true. So I don't think the actual intent, the primary interpretation, should be these church period times, but they do line up great. And this is the one we want to be a part of. This period of time in church history really is what's considered the, the time of the Great Awakening, the Second Great Awakening, and some people call it the Missionary Age starting around 1730. And really, it doesn't have necessarily an end. But I will say we've seen a tapering off. Uh, for those of us who've been with us over the years, I think twice I've played a short clip 
about the 1857 revival in New York and just how it swept the globe. And there were, you know, weeks and weeks waiting lists to get into children's ministry. And there were thousands of people being baptized weekly in America, and it swept the globe. We see all these great preachers come out of it. And so truly, what we see in this church is the heart of that time period. And so really, if there was one church that we wanted to take stuff away from, this is the church we want to take away from. Uh, we're all going to find ourselves in the church of Ephesus. Time to time, and definitely in the Middle East right now, there's people who are going to be learning from the church of Smyrna and the persecution that it goes through. Pergamus and Thyatira, I believe, still exist very much so. And Sardis, what we covered last week, truly represents that mainstream denominational church where many churches have gone down and they're kind of in this group. It's the dead church. Next week, we're doing the lukewarm church. And I feel like the Lord's been helping me discern the difference between the lukewarm church and the dead church because they look really similar sometimes. But this week, it's the faithful church. This week, it's the church with the open door. And so I want to dig in and look more at this missionary age, the faithful church here, and what it has for us today here in Grandview. Because that's, the thing. the most important part is, what does this mean for me? And so he writes the church of Philadelphia, and he says, he who is holy, he who is true. So again, he's giving his titles and his accolades. And then it says, he who has the key of David. Now, you could maybe spiritualize this, talking more symbolically of, the, of David himself and, and the attributes of King David, because I think any one of us would want to be like King David. When the Bible says he's a man after God's own heart, that always speaks to me. That always a man after God's own heart. How I want to be a man that God can say, Joe is a man after God's own heart. I'm going to put that right up there with well done, good and faithful servant, right? I mean, these are the things you want to hear. And the best part about David for you and for me is that he was a murderer and he was an adulterer. We were just going, I was studying Isaiah, right? It gives woe to the people who are given to wine, but also the one who mixes intoxicating drink, talking about those who try and get someone else drunk. And that's what he did right before he got Uzziah killed. He tried to get him drunk to make bad choices. I mean, David broke every rule in the book. He stole. You're not supposed to touch that showbread from the tabernacle. He took that. I mean, he asked for it, but still, it was, it was forbidden. Yet he's a man after God's own heart, which reminds me that me being a man after God's own heart has a lot more to do with my heart and God's grace than it does my performance. It's a heart thing. It's about the relationship. It's not about checking the boxes and not making mistakes, you know. We strive for obedience. We strive to show the Lord we love him by serving him, but a man after God's own heart. And all that said, that's not what the text is saying. <laughs> but this key of David, I, I heard some pastor I was listening to did a whole long sermon on David. It was great. I loved it. But there's a literal key of David, and it's spoken of in Isaiah 22. So if you're a note taker, in Isaiah 22, really 15 all the way up to 23, it starts by seeing uh, someone being uh, rebuked for being a poor steward. And the key is taken from Shemna, and it's given to Eliakim. So in verse 20, we see Eliakim get the key. And it's really like a key to the storehouses. This is actually during the reign of Hezekiah. It's not during David's time. But there was a key. Isaiah 22, read it on your own. And it was basically the storehouses, the treasury. This was, it's interesting, uh, a little fact. I know I had heard it before, but I had to hear the story again, that the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, right? There are... Um, a whole bunch of churches that kind of oversee it. The Roman Catholic Church, you've got the Orthodox Churches, the Coptic Church, all these different churches. And because they can't, they all fight over who gets to do what and who gets to, who gets to sweep the steps. They're like fighting over who has the right to do this. Interesting fact, the key to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is held by a Muslim. They gave it to a Muslim family so that it would be unbiased. And they're the ones who actually opened and closed the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. There's just a fast fact you can stick in your pocket and remember later. This is just free information, just for you guys who like nerdy facts like me. But this is key, and it unlocks everything. And it was a literal key that unlocked storehouses at the palace. And so it is a literal quote, the second half of the verse, he who opens and no one shuts, and he who shuts and no one opens, that is straight out of verse 22 of Isaiah 22. Um, and so as we go through this, he's just telling them, though, that I've got the key. And I've got the key to everything. 
And so he's letting you know that Jesus is the one who's got the power to open things and to close things. He's establishing that. And then we see in verse 8, I know your works, as he tells every church, emphasizing that he knows the hidden things, the secret things, the things that we don't know. No one else at church knows about this, but Jesus knows. And he tells them, and I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. So this is this open door. And again, I, I'm trying my best in studying, seeing all the different ways people interpret these texts, but I think one big thing we see is throughout the New Testament, again and again and again, we see references to open doors and the sharing of the gospel. Again, for the note takers. In 1 Corinthians 16, 9, Paul talks about an open door. He's talking about an open door to minister. In 2 Corinthians 2.12, we see another open door verse talking about, I need a door open so I can get out and, and really minister to these people. But I'm going to flip back to Colossians chapter 4. And in Colossians chapter 4, we see a little more of a text. And I just wanted to read it because it was such a good little text. And so Colossians 4, starting in... When you go to Colossians, there's such small books. I went from Colossians to Galatians. I'm like, that's not right at all what I'm trying to read right there. Colossians. There we go. I'm going to start in verse 2. And it says, Continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. Meanwhile, praying for us also that God would open to us a door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in chains, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom towards those who are outside, redeeming the time. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. You see, Paul was talking about, I want God to open the door and do the work that we can't do. See, the big thing that we can't do is prepare hearts. We cannot prepare people's hearts. And I have had some long theological debates with close-hearted people. I'm good at what I do. I'm not the best, but I'm pretty good. I'm good at debating. I'm good at laying out the facts and the arguments. I feel pretty confident with your average person in the lower valley. But when their hearts are closed, it doesn't matter what you say. I mean, you could just, I mean, you could do anything. And there's nothing you do can make an effect on them. But here's the cool thing is that I really, truly, honestly believe that since I've been in Grandview, and I've been teaching down here for years, but moved down about three years ago or so, and in that time, I've been praying for revival. And when you pray for revival, you pray for God to go out and do the work. And we just stay faithful. We stay faithful here at the church doing what we do. We study the Word. We keep praying. We seek the Holy Spirit. We love one another. We just play church. I don't even play. You know what I mean? We, we just do the thing that we're supposed to do. We continue in our brotherly love for one another. But I'll tell you, in the last few weeks, this is in the last few weeks, literally, not in preparation for Philippian or for Revelation chapter 3, just in life. I feel like I'm seeing the door open where people are asking about church. This is just with me, but I'm seeing other people make the comment too that there's a hunger I'm finding in the valley, in Grandview. My neighbor, I, I didn't even invite him to church. It just church came up and he invited himself. He didn't make it yet. I need to see and talk to the guy again, but it was like he was excited to hear about church. I've had students complain about the youth study. Well, I've never gotten an invite. I'm like, well, I'm not supposed to invite you. Like, I'm a public school teacher. There's some conflicts there, but you're invited. You know, so I'm always trying to invite them, you know, some roundabout way. Uh, but people are, like, asking to get invited to church. And I'm going to ask you guys, like, when was the last time you invited someone to church? Because I'm, I'm just saying my experience lately has just been people receiving not everybody. I mean, there's still tons of people who are so closed, right? But I've seen so many people lately just seem hungry to want to go to church. People are going off and praying on their own at churches because they don't know where to go. They need people to open doors to them. Hey, the door is open here. I think that's the thing with unbelievers. They don't realize the door is open sometimes. And they're hungry. And the scary part is that 
unlike the Christian church, and I don't mean like Grand New Christian, I mean the church, there are other churches out there sending people door to door, and there's hungry people looking for, for help. And so truly, I think there's a real open door, and that's the big thing with this church in Philadelphia. He was telling them, I know your works. I don't want to jump ahead. I was going to do it later. But he tells them, right, that you have a little faith, but you've stayed true to my word. You haven't denied my name. That's all I'm looking for. He didn't say, you guys are of massive faith and perfection. No, you're just a, you guys have got a little faith, and you're staying true to the word. And guess what? I've opened the door. Because you know what they say, right? To move a mountain, you just have to have the faith of the size of the Titanic. Right? Yeah, mustard seed. People were excited to see mustard seeds and mustard plants in Israel. You just grab the thing off and eat it. it. Tastes like mustard, but a little different, a little spicier, actually. But look what he says. I want to look at Colossians before flipping back. He tells them that he wants to pray for the open door. I'm telling you guys, I think there is an open door. We might be past Colossians 4.3. So then what does he say next, right? After praying for that open door, if there's truly an open door with the people in your life, well, continue to pray that you make it manifest. <laughs> Let people know there's an open door. It is funny because, you know, people who might want to debate religion, a casual invite to church, people don't seem to get offended about. People also don't get offended when you offer prayer. I've never had people just get angry at me. Now you want to tell them about their sinful lifestyle and everything, yeah, that can get people worked up, but just to start, hey, you want to come to church? And some people need the direct approach. And other people, you never know, sitting through church four, six, eight weeks, and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit does the work and they ditch their sins on their own. As we ought to speak in verse four, it's what we ought to do. Paul recognized this is, this is what we were made for, is to save lost people, save lost souls, to point people to Jesus Christ. That we would walk in wisdom towards those who are on the outside, redeeming time. Because right, time is short, and all these people, there's people dying out there, and their time is ticking away. We redeem the time. How do you redeem it? You don't waste it. There's so many ways to waste our time these days. And I think as, as the history of time proceeds, we see ways to waste time increase. <laughs> there are so many you know, fun games to play, and movies to watch, and things to do. I feel bad for my generation and the generation coming up underneath me. We're so used to being entertained. We really are. I always love, some people get rubbed wrong by the quote, but Leonard Ravenhill said that entertainment is Satan's replacement for joy. That we can truly have joyous, joy-ish, joy-ish, yeah. Joyous, joyous, there we go. I always make up words as I go, you guys will follow. Joyous lives, that we'd have lives full of joy. That's the easier way of saying it. I mean, just joy. But truly, when there's nothing to do and I feel empty, I usually fill that with entertainment. It's, and I'm not saying you can't go to the movies, I'm not saying you can't watch sports, I'm not saying you can't. I'm just saying that truly, at the end of the day, I, I've had those days where it's like, I just want to watch some movies, and I watch like three in a row. You just watch like the entire Lord of the Rings trilogy in one day. There's like, you know, 14 hours gone. <laughs> and then it's like, I don't feel any better at the end. I really don't. I always tell myself, you need a break. And then I get my break, I'm like, I don't feel braked. <laughs> I don't feel any better after this. We redeem the time, we ask for wisdom from God, what to say, and we let our speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt. And I really think, and this has been on my heart a lot lately, and here's it in the text, this idea of grace and truth. It's a balance. Wise as, as serpents, but gentle as doves, cunning like a serpent, gentle like a dove. It's not easy to be both, you know, grace and truth. And we pray this morning, when we gather and pray in the mornings at 10, and Dale, myself, we, we specifically we've been praying, Lord, like, let those of us who are struggling with boldness, help them step up their game. Lord, with those of us who don't struggle with boldness, man, give us, give us gentle words, help us be loving, but that we wouldn't be too far on the spectrum, that we would have grace, but seasoned with salt. And you know what? When you put salt on a wound, it burns. That you may know how you ought to answer each one. So I think there's an open door in Grandview, in the Lower Valley. I was so touched when we got back from Israel. Pastor Dallas from, from Toppenish, uh, he's an awesome man whom I admire very much. And one of the first posts he says 
on Facebook, right? It's just, I'm so happy to be back in God's Valley. That's how I put it. I'm like, yes, I like that. It's like, I'm back in God's Valley. I'm not just the Yakima Valley. I'm not just in the Lower Valley. This is God's Valley. And I think God's doing a work here. And there's an open door. And you'll notice he says that no one can shut. When God opens the door, people can't get in your way. I think you can get in your way, though. I think that's one of the things with God. He lets us mess things up, but he paves the way for us. It's, it's wide open. I mean, can you imagine just a huge barn door, and you're like the one guy who would actually walk off to the side and run your head into the beam? You know, a 10-foot wide door, and you somehow miss it. It's like the broad side of a barn. You can't even hit that thing sometimes. And notice he says here that you have a little strength. Again, you've kept my word, and you've not denied my name. That's all he's looking for. A little bit of strength. Lord, I don't have much, but I will muster up what I have for you. And I'm not going to compromise on your word. And when people come and ask me, and I'm in front of my friends, I'm in front of my family, I'm in front of my coworkers, I'm not going to deny your name. I'm going to be a Christian everywhere I go, a little Christ. I'm going to represent you. And when the door is open and people obey, that's when revivals happen. This church period was that great awakening period. So we'll look at one guy. So, born amongst many, many brothers, he was like the 15th child in this family. And of course, he almost dies in a fire as a little kid. And, but his parents, somehow, when they saved him barely from the fire, they felt like God had a purpose for him. The fact that he was saved from the fire. And he grew up to be an Anglican pastor like his father. And he was born in an era which I would say was truly where we started to see, started to see the fading of the glory of the Reformation Church. Knox, Luther, these guys who, who fought Rome and they, they paved the way. Once again, we see a, a huge amount of martyrs for their faith because they wanted to believe the Bible. They wanted to stand firm in God's grace. Scripture only, grace only, Jesus Christ only, all the solas that they believed in. I mean, this was the thing. But over time, again, we just watch, this happens in churches, that time goes by, the zeal fades, and at this point in the 1700s, the church, the Protestant church, it became really big into, uh, not works is the right word, humanitarian efforts. Now, there's nothing wrong with humanitarian efforts. But this became the focus of the church. It was truly digging wells and feeding the hungry, and that became the real emphasis of the church. What was the church on earth for? Well, it was to feed the poor and help the widows, but that became the purpose, not like the fruit of Christians being Christians, but became the goal of Christians. And so what does he do? He went to America to help the Indians, and he moves to America, and he's witnessing to the Indians, and he's trying to you know, help them get clothes and food and everything they need. And he feels like he gets nowhere, absolutely nowhere. And so he returns home to England, broken over this whole state that he, he's not effective as a minister, he can't do anything right. And he's in London, and he passes by a Moravian church. They were the ones who had that hundred year long prayer meeting where the, their church was not empty for over a hundred years. Every hour, this is not like, you know, not rounding numbers here. It was over 100 years, not a minute was there not prayer taking place. They put out more missionaries than anyone during their time. And he goes by their church and he overhears them teaching uh, Romans, specifically Martin Luther's commentary on the book of Romans. And they hear that verse that has changed so many lives of the people who we look up to, the saints of old, uh, Luther commenting on Habakkuk 2.4 found in the beginning of Romans, the just shall live by faith. And this guy started listening, and he started hearing. Ah, it's all about faith. It's not about me helping people. It's not about me being good. It's about me having a saving faith in Jesus Christ. He heard Luther talk about relationship over religion. This idea, it's about me knowing God. It's a love thing. Love is hard, I know. When you find you're all alone. Love's hard, I know When you don't know where to go Love's hard, I know When you know you can't go home